a rare glimpse at a wild secret. One, two, three, haul away! Protecting the vast Western Arctic. The beauty here is subtle and it's quiet. Nothing quiet about this big game bird, but its sagebrush habitat is at risk. It's called coal ash and it's making people sick. Members of one Nevada tribe battle the toxic coal ash from a power plant with clean answers from Mother Nature. And what big teeth you have. These high-tech collars help scientists track elusive California mountain lions to keep them and their habitat safe. Ready for touchdown? All this and more now on a new season of This American Land. Funding for This American Land is provided by the Turner Foundation. Hello and welcome to This American Land. I'm your new host, Ed Arnett, and we've got some great stories for you today about the conservation of America's natural resources, our landscapes, waters, wildlife, and the people that are dedicated to making conservation work for all of us. This is our fifth season on public television across the country. And we're proud of our reputation as America's leading conservation news program. Today we start off in Alaska, the far north of Alaska, where we join a rafting expedition on a river taking us into the National Petroleum Reserve, a vast and unspoiled land with a misleading name, a place some call America's wildest secret. part of America, and it's not easy to get to this place. You fly in a pretty small propeller plane, and then you get in a really small plane to land on these gravel bars, you know, and, and people are like, we're going to land there? I'm excited to see people that want to come up here and want to experience this place. You're really um, like an expedition. You're out there just experiencing this country for the first time. You know, it's just the very beginning of autumn. I was walking around last night, and some of the leaves are turning, and the caribou are just starting to move through. I'm excited that everybody's on the ground, and, and we're all here. The adventure seekers among us do come up to the reserve to get out on the land and experience a completely wild place. The National Petroleum Reserve is what we call this place, but it is a jewel in the rough. It's 23 million acres, and that's all public lands. And 11 million acres are special areas, and those are areas special for wildlife and conservation. fresh caribou tracks here. It's a snowshoe. Now these animals are well adapted to that deep snow. Approximately more than half of the reserve is open to oil and gas leasing and there are companies right now uh, working to get permits to do some exploration and development. There currently is no active uh, development in the reserve but the time is near. There's a huge amount of carbon build up here. You know, one of the things about the Western Arctic is that it's, uh, it doesn't fit very well on a postcard. It's not Yosemite. The beauty here is subtle and it's quiet. It's a place that's hard for some people to relate to. It's, uh, it's important nonetheless. No actual plants were harmed in the filming of this movie. Actually, while we have a hole here, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> We're at 
the Atibalik River. We are watching it flow north. It eventually meets the Colville River. This is our home for the next week. They're not going to do leasing, oil and gas leasing in these areas. Currently, right. no. Okay. Yes. We've got temporary protection for just about 11 million acres. And from the conservation perspective, we would like to have a little more permanent protection. I think this country is just so big that there's always something new to, to see, a new river to float. What we're seeing are these big overhanging pieces because the permafrost is melted underneath it, which is kind of what holds it all up. So as it melts, uh, the river can work at it and erode it away. The wildlife is always moving around, so you never, you never know what you're going to see. So it's always exciting. The values that are here, the wildlife, the scale of the natural forces at work are infinitely more important than the barrels of oil that are that are here. I think that with the modern technology of the oil industry, this, the National Petroleum Reserve is not all that inaccessible. I mean, look at the development in Prudhoe Bay, look at the offshore development that has occurred. And so in the future, there will be pressure, there will be very strong momentum to develop these resources. And we're seeing that already. Reel it in as much as you can. Oh, nice grayling. If we're smart and careful and take the long-term view of the availability of these resources to the American people, we actually can have it both ways. We can have our cake and eat it too. Happy birthday, dear Ed. Look at that! <laughs> Happy birthday Blueberry chocolate cake. Wow. <laughs> of course. Yeah. We have to acknowledge that this is an area set aside for development, but not every corner is open to it. We just want to be sure that, as we know it will happen, that we are protecting the wildlife and the landscapes. Part of what's complicated in the NPRA is that the local people here, you know, the sort of community leaders, are more concerned about economic survival, and, and rightly so. There's more than enough land to do all of these things if you do it the right way. It just requires a, like a, a plan that everybody can buy into. If you could do more planning than was done during the, the Industrial Revolution to make sure that you protect the game corridors, that you make sure that you don't do billions of dollars of environmental cleanup afterwards. We can talk about the abstract environmental goals, which are terribly important, but there's nothing like coming to a place like this to really understand its importance. One, two, three, all the way! This is the NPRA. The National Petroleum Reserve Alaska, or as what I like to call it, the Western Arctic. It gives you this idea that the oil's just like bubbling out of the ground. You don't see petroleum, you see a lot of wild. We're at the confluence of the Colville and the Atibalik. We're in the MPRA. One of the most pristine uh, wilderness areas I've ever seen. It's certainly not my image of what we think about a high development area. It is the National Petroleum Reserve, but to me at least it represents the last really great land conservation opportunity in the United States. Now we go to the Western Plains, where private landowners, state and federal agencies, and conservationists are working to conserve essential habitat for the greater sage-grouse, an iconic species that was once common across the West, but is now facing hard times because the sagebrush it depends on to survive is declining.
probably 35, 40 of them scattered down the road here. Kind of resting out in the open country right now. Most people don't ever get a chance to see something like that, just sitting on the road and drive up to them and get a good up close look at them. The greater sage grouse is the second largest game bird in North America. They were found across 14 states in the West, but we're down in numbers. It's suggested that we had about 16 million at the turn of the prior century. We're down to somewhere right in the vicinity of 400,000 now. So the sage grouse really is a modern day canary in the coal mine. And that canary is telling us right now the sagebrush and sagebrush ecosystems are in decline. We actually call them an umbrella species. And what that concept actually means is that if you provide habitat for sage grouse, you in essence cover up to 350 species of plants and animals that are dependent on that system. Sagebrush ecosystems provide a wide range of recreational opportunities, everything from hiking and biking and camping to hunting of big game and upland game birds. And these are really important activities that provide local economies great sources of revenue. This is the, the forest that makes up most of the western landscape as we know it. Underneath it, we've got grasses growing, and then you can see the other plants that are forbs. And all of these are food for the sage grouse and for the other animals that use this miniature forest as a place to live. We had 19 million sheep in the state of Wyoming alone, and they obliterated the understory for the sage. But in order to deal with what's going on now, we've had to recognize that continued fragmentation in the east by gas and oil development, et cetera, has been the biggest damaging factor. So in the western portion of the range of the greater sage grouse, probably the greatest threat is fire, particularly with cheatgrass, which is a very flashy fuel. Nothing utilizes cheatgrass. Prairie dogs don't even eat cheatgrass. And so that'll tell you something about the plant and it spreads very quickly. The way I come at sage grouse is both from a personal and a professional angle. I am a hunter and I've been hunting since I was a little kid. It's what we ate growing up. And so sage grouse is actually an integral part to the places that I hunt. If sage grouse aren't doing good, then pronghorn aren't doing good and mule deer aren't doing good. And those are the things that my family eats. Ranchers know that the health of their land is dependent on diversity. It's diversity of vegetation, diversity of wildlife. The more diverse their rangeland is, the better their cows do. The philosophy of the ranch is to continue to manage the ranch in the method it is being, as long as it is economically feasible for improvement of wildlife habitat and to continue to operate as a working ranch. And it's worked. There's an example that's prime sage grouse habitat, and it's also prime mule deer habitat. They just, they use the same type of plants, the same type of range. So whatever you do for one species benefits everything before it's all said and done. The fact that an abundant, once widely distributed and fairly liberally harvested game bird is now being proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act should be a concern to everyone. The only real solution is to develop really strong conservation plans, both at the state level and at the federal level. What this means is that in the past, we would have planned each one of these individual areas separately. But with great foresight, the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service have moved into a planning process by which we're redoing the RMPs, or resource management plans, for all of the areas that have sage grouse. First thing that sage grouse need to survive is good sagebrush. They eat sagebrush, they hide from predators under it, they nest against it, they spend the winters huddled to the base of it. Good, open, full expanses of sagebrush are the first thing they need. We know what's causing it, and we know how to fix it. All the species in this country are all a user of the sagebrush. We need to manage and worry about the sage grouse, but we can't just manage for them. We have to manage for all species. We seem to think that they can go somewhere else. The habitat they have is all there is.
There's growing concern nationwide about the harmful effects of coal ash, the toxic residue produced by coal-fired power plants. Huge dumps of coal ash have accumulated for years. Some have spilled into rivers, poisoning drinking water and killing fish and other wildlife. Wind can carry coal ash through the air, contaminating neighboring communities. In this report with Earth Justice from Nevada, we see how a band of Native Americans living next to a power plant has been affected by coal ash. The Reed Gardner Power Station sits right next to the Moapa River Reservation. It's just one of the more than 600 coal-fired power plants across America, but it, like every other coal plant, has a dirty little secret. It's called coal ash, and it's making people sick. Coal ash is the toxic waste generated by every lump of coal we burn. It's laced with arsenic, mercury, lead, and other toxic metals. It's the second largest waste stream in America, and it's subject to less regulation than the garbage you take to the curb every week. At Reed Gardner, the coal ash is put into landfills and mixed with water and dumped into ponds. And then, when the wind blows just wrong, it picks up like a sandstorm and blows right at the reservation. It's just one of the hundreds of places across America where coal ash is threatening communities and making people sick. I want to be out. I want to be able to do what the Constitution of the United States says, that I have the right for happiness. Well, I don't have that now. I, I, when the wind blows, I'm a prisoner. I go back to jail. The coal ash ponds at Reed Gardner start at the plant and then stretch across the desert to within a few hundred yards of the homes on the Moapa River Reservation. The prevailing winds carry constant pollution straight at the Paiute people who live there. And despite the high documented rates of lung, heart, and thyroid disease, the Reed Gardner plant is currently trying to expand their coal ash ponds and landfills. Um, I live the closest to the ponds and then the, and, uh, the blowing dust. And I get all of it every time it blows. Uh, I get sick from the air that is coming, being blown towards us. Fatigue, uh, headaches, nosebleeds, dizziness. You know, I suffer from all that, and that's what they acknowledge. It's what they don't acknowledge, you know, the document that addresses the chromiums, the manganese, the leads, the, you know, all of the other bad stuff. I mean, what long-term effect does that have? I've never had asthma until I moved here. I now have to use an inhaler. And my little girl got her first inhaler last week. Well, I was um, diagnosed with hyperthyroidism. I've had a sore throat for six months. I associate it with that plant because after reading the chemicals and the poisons in there, It has to be. You flip on a light switch. That power does not come from that light switch. That power is generated somewhere else, and it impacts people. Many people on the reservation have decided they're tired of being polluted on from the outside. Now, they're looking for solutions to this problem on the inside. So at the same time, the Reed Gardner plant is trying to expand its coal ash storage capability. The Moapa Paiutes are trying to show a different way forward, one that uses the resources that are already there and moves us past coal. I'm working for a green energy, and um, where we're going to have a solar plant. And so I think we're the first tribe in the United States to be putting this uh, plant on a reservation at this uh, large scale. So I guess I'm really um, proud, and I'm kind of their first worker. No pollution, no nothing, no sound or smell or nothing coming from it. You know, to go ahead and be a part of that connection, to be connected with the sun, making it into energy. To be, to be that connected with nature, Mother Earth, plants, rocks, animals. I mean, that's basically who we are. You know, that's what we started out with, you know, back before this was a reservation. You know, that's how our people were from back then, lived off, lived from the earth. In some ways, I just feel like the Indian people are here uh, for a reason, and maybe it's to try to help do what we can to preserve the environment. We can't not just sit here and just take it, but to go ahead and do something about it. You know, 
you know, to go ahead and have a solo project, say, hey, you know, there's alternative ways. We are doing it. We are trying to go ahead and be more, um, more positive. We're trying to be more, um, more active. I'm trying to be more, you know, more uh, supportive with regard to the, the environment. For years, Reed Gardner and hundreds of other coal plants have gotten away with polluting people with toxic coal ash. Finally, the EPA is deciding how to regulate it. Strong regulations will help the people of the Moapa River Reservation and the countless other communities across America who are affected by coal ash. There, there are things that, that, uh, that they could do, but a lot of people say it, say it costs too much money. Well, how much money do you put on in your life? What do you, what do you think I'm worth? You think I'm worth nothing? You come visit the reservation on one of those days when it's really bad and you'll understand. You would never want to live here. You would never want to raise your kids here. So anybody that is, you know, that wants to not make it a hazard waste needs to experience it. And if they experience it, they will know that it's bad. And for the people that are trying to make it a hazardous waste, more power to you. You're on a mission to try to help at least this tribe and any other people that's near coal ash. Protecting the vast range of Northern California's mountain lions is a complicated task. Researchers are using biology and computer science to better understand the movements of these majestic cats. And as Miles O'Brien shows us in our Science Nation report, the effort can pay off for humans as well. It takes a hound dog's nose to sniff out the elusive mountain lion in the wilds of Northern California. They're very secretive, you know, they're nocturnal. They are a very hard animal to study, but it's, it's partly for that reason that um, I find them so intriguing. After tranquilizing the big cat with a dart, wildlife ecologist Chris Wilmers and colleagues take hair and blood samples, then attach this collar. But this is no mere GPS tracker. It's a high-tech electronic diary recording the animal's location, behavior, and physiology in unprecedented detail. And this up here has the GPS and all the technology, and then battery power is down here. But we can also communicate with the collars uh, so we can get data off the collars remotely. With support for the National Science Foundation, Wilmers and a team at the University of California, Santa Cruz, have built this collar to track the cat's movements, metabolism, and habitat preferences. Well, the big thing that it'll let us do is really understand details about their biology, how they make a living on the landscape, how they get enough calories to sustain themselves and reproduce and have young. Here is our more recent prototype, so you'll notice they're getting smaller. Computer engineer Gabriel Elkheim designed sensors for the collars using technology he's developed for autonomous and unmanned aerial vehicles. We're trying to get something small enough, robust enough, We're trying to make this thing very power aware so that it turns on different pieces as it needs and turns them off as appropriate. We actually try to determine in real time what the animal is doing, whether he is trotting, running, walking, pouncing, stalking. Another team member, biologist Terry Williams, works with dolphins, studying how animals in captivity use energy. She says tests on captive mountain lions could shed light on their metabolic needs and that could head off deadly confrontations. And maybe we'll get to a point of saying, I can predict when you shouldn't have sheep out or goats out because I know that this cat is hungry at this time and therefore let's, let's prevent the problem. That's the power of this, this technology. Looking at here in the blue is the GPS locations of 11F. This is a young female Wilmers works with state transportation planners to identify range boundaries and select areas for safe crossings such as these to give mountain lions and other wildlife near urban areas safe passage. Keeping close tabs on these felines will hopefully lead to fewer catastrophes.
Now here's a quick look at a story from our next show. I think if you live here in Bristol Bay, salmon just become a part of your life. I would very much like to have my children, my grandchildren, to continue on fishing. I would, I would hate to lose that. This region of Alaska provides almost half of America's seafood. But will it be protected for future generations? Driver going down. It's called the Billion Oyster Project, and you'll definitely be surprised to find out where it is and who's in charge. One oyster can filter around 50 gallons of water a day. You'd never expect like such a small little Diver's organism to filter that much water and clean our harbor. Thanks for watching, and remember, you can catch us anytime at thisamericanland.org. We'd like to hear your comments and ideas for stories that we should cover. We'll see you next time. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org. Funding for This American Land is provided by the Turner Foundation.